I conceive that the land belongs to a vast family, of which many are dead, few are living, and countless yet unborn. With these words, spoken by a wise Nigerian chief almost exactly a hundred years ago, I greet you as members of that same family on this beautiful planet where we have been telling our stories for as long as the last million years. I say a million years as that takes us to the era of our direct ancestor, Homo erectus, who was probably the first to be able to make fires and to hunt cooperatively enough to bring in a regular diet of meat. And it seems to have been these two factors, the cooperative behavior as well as the change in diet that allowed our brains to expand vastly in the frontal areas, the most modern parts of the brain to develop, and the parts which are essential for complex social living. And yet from there, it was another 750,000 years at least before our own species, Homo sapiens, emerged on the Earth. However, it seems that it was only in the last 10,000 years that we underwent the particular changes uh, into the form of humanity as we know it today. I'm going to be arguing, however, that in the last 500 years, we've, un we've started to undergo an even more radical change into a particular culture, a culture of addiction that is taking us right out of our context. But first, let's go back another three and a half million years to when our distant ancestor, Australopithecus, first stood up and with two bare feet strode forth on this, our beautiful African soil. But our brains, of course, have been around a lot longer than that. We need to go back 65 million years about to meet our first mammal ancestors and an amazing 500 million years to meet the first complex invertebrates and possibly the first brains of all. So it's been a long journey for these brains of ours as each step, at each step being evolving in response to the world around us. So let's consider what that world was like for most of our time on this planet. And I would suggest to you that it can be summed up in a single word, wild, in the environment, being shaped far more than we were doing the shaping, in touch with the wilderness as part of it. And you just need to wander up our beautiful mountain here to get a sense of that. And if you do, and if you really listen, what you'll notice that is that it's, it's not quiet, as we like to imagine with nature, but full of sound. And if you really look, you'll notice it's full of shapes and shades and colors. Um, and so if you open all your senses, this experience comes alive to you, and you realize what a total experience it is. Not on and off like the city, where the sharpness of shapes and shades and colors abruptly pierce the senses. Um, but not so comfortable either, and not nearly so predictable. So as such, uh, the essence of what a wilderness is comes alive to us. It is complex and diverse, but it is far from certain. It is always on the move, and it demands our total attention, a total sense of consciousness. Now, Spend a little more time in that wilderness, um, deep in the wilderness, and as you get a little bit closer, you'll realize that it's not at all comfortable, and it, it, it really can get quite difficult. We get dirty, sweaty, smelly, scratched, bitten, uncomfortable, lonely, and perhaps really frightened as we realize this nature thing is real, and it might even have us for breakfast. But somehow, if you endure all that, you notice a new sense of self arising. Time and space seem to take on a different dimension, and we begin to accept that we are part of it, that we are being watched as much as we are watching, in total contact with the wilderness. And as a psychiatrist, um, I've spent enough time in detox units uh, to recognize a withdrawal syndrome when I see one. And I'm ashamed to admit it was as I stood in the queue of a fast food outlet um, after a particularly intense time in the wilderness struggling to control my cravings that the thought occurred to me, am I addicted to this thing we call civilization? So let's consider some of the essential features of addiction. 
Firstly, the need is insatiable. There's a continuous drive to stronger, purer, faster, more direct. You don't see many alcoholics sipping gently on a light beer. The, the stronger the reward, the less anything else seems to matter. Modern technology has given us ways of accessing those rewards more and more directly. So it seems to be about shortcuts here, ways of getting that pleasure and satisfaction without connection to either the hard work involved or the consequences thereof. The more we trigger the reward system, uh, the more directly the reward system is triggered, the quicker the path to dependence. So you get hooked much more quickly from smoking crack cocaine than you do from snorting coke, and you get hooked much more quickly on snorting coke than you ever would on chewing coca leaves. The further we progress down the pathway of addiction, the less we seem to be able to cope with everything else in life. And, and I thought it was quite funny hearing these I'm nervous, I'm missing my cell phone comments, because it raises that question. Is our reliance on them making us less capable for dealing with everyday life? What we know about the reward system is that it's based in an extremely primitive part of the, the brain called the limbic system, located around about here, um, inside our temporal lobes. Um, yeah, this system's been around an extremely long time, um, from the time we were reptiles. And um, basically how it works is when it becomes activated, it releases large amounts of a brain chemical called dopamine, which then signal intense feelings of pleasure. So what purpose did this reward system have in our evolving brains? What use was it to us? Well, if you think about all that time we've spent in the wild state, and you think about just about anything we find addictive, what you'll realize is that these things were incredibly hard to come by in the natural state. Um, obviously, drugs with the intense feelings of pleasure they produce, but also other things, sugar, salt, fatty foods, uh, riches, obviously, um, sex, social status. Take sugar, for example. Think about it in the primal state. You, you had to, to get that, you had to get stung by swarms of bees or fight some baboons for rotten or, or rather sour fruit. It wasn't just there in a jar next to the cave kettle. Um, there's not a lot of fat on venison. You had to go out and, and hunt a mammoth or something large and fat to get, get nice fatty food. And sex and social status, um, well, let's just say the dating game was rather different then. So I would suggest to you that the system evolved as a way of getting us out of our comfort zones. You needed a single-minded drive to get there and not much consideration of the consequences. Now, if you think about that, you'll realize that the system is an absolute gift to the marketplace because there will always be something bigger, better, shinier, faster, purer, stronger to sell. So let's fast forward a little bit back on our evolutionary journey to a period about 10,000 years ago. What seems to have happened then is that in several parts of the world and in a relatively short period of time, humans were able to take, take advantage of a number of natural cereal grass hybrids which evolved um, to produce seed grains that were actually too large to be dispersed by the wind. And in this, the symbiotic relationship, which we now refer to as farming, arose between our, these species and our ancestors who were able to collect, plant, and harvest them. And around about the same time, we were also able to domesticate animals. And so suddenly, possibly for the first time in our evolution, we were able to settle down more or less permanently in one place and to settle down in groups that, in, in relatively large groups, without causing widespread depletion of the surrounding environment. So suddenly, we had large society and everything that involves. We had to learn to get on with one another, to develop a common morality, uh, belief systems, and expand our sense of property and ownership and all that that involves. And most importantly of all, we had to learn to live with nature in a new way, in a partnership. We had to learn to be patient, to allow our crops to grow and our animals to breed. So, I would suggest to you that around this time, we, we began to develop a second motivational system, 
one that was specifically adapted for living in partnership with one another and in partnership with nature. Now we know the brain was actually already, at the beginning of that era, was already the size it is today. Um, but what we've learned about the evolving brain is that the final product in the mature brain is entirely dependent on what we put that brain through as it develops. Um, and so what seems to have happened in this era is that we really developed the function and probably the microstructure of that modern, most modern of parts in the brain, the prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain, situ situated right behind the forehead, is the seat of our ability to interact socially, to interrelate with one another, to follow rules, um, to plan, to use complex information, and most importantly of all, it is very important for inhibiting the, the information that, that, that comes up from the reward system. Now, um, what a number of recent uh, large population-based studies have shown is that that system um, and, and the reward system seem to be competing with one another. Values, human values tend to cluster into two groups. Self-enhancement values of power, material gain, and social status in the other, and self-transcendent values of universalism and benevolence to all people and creatures in the other group. And I would suggest to you that it was the second group of values and the motivational system attached to them that arose during this era of what is known as the agricultural revolution. The other fascinating area of study is in a field known as temporal discounting, where they've developed testing paradigms for a behavior um, that we understand as our ability to delay gratification. So in short, they offer you $1,000 today or $1,000 tomorrow? Easy answer. But then they ask you how much less you would accept now instead of that promised $1,000. Next week, next month, in two months, three months, four months. And what we all do is we accept less and less right now instead of that promised $1,000 as it recedes into the future. Um, what they've shown is that any choice to take the immediate reward is associated with your limbic activation of your reward system and choices to delay gratification with frontal activity. And what they've shown is that whether you're, if you're addicted to any substance, your ability to delay gratification is poorer and poorer. So you go more and more for lower immediate rewards. And what the research also seems to be showing is that within consumerist cultures, everyone's ability to delay gratification is getting poorer and poorer, and not surprisingly, rates of addiction are skyrocketing. So what's going on? I would suggest to you that the very approach that has brought us so many benefits is also leading to our own downfall. Um, beginning with the, the, the Cartesian split between mind and body and the Protestant Reformation, we seem to have taken the idea of God out of nature, out of the world, and the idea of the soul has been limited to a tiny piece in the brain. Um, this was followed by the so-called enlightenment, um, and we began to lose contact with our own feelings, with one another, and our own planet um, in this obsession with rationality and the individual subject. And from there, it seems to have been a downhill slide into the culture of the commodity, defined essentially by how badly we want it, and we want it now. And now this culture is becoming globalized. Um, all over the world, and it seems to be running over other cultures. We're losing languages, for example, at a rate of only over 300 per year. Those are whole meaning systems, and all the wisdom they carry being lost in this stampede for stronger, better, and faster. And so, like the addict lining up for a stronger and stronger fix, we're becoming a global monoculture. And in a time of change, that's a very dangerous thing to be. So we need to find ways of connecting again and of respecting again, because when we connect with the environment, we, use, we become mindful using our whole brains, not just one part. So this definitely isn't about saying, just say no to the reward system. It's brought us incredible innovation and quite a lot of fun too. Nor is it about worshiping the prefrontal cortex, because you can be a total psychopath and have a very good prefrontal cortex. So what this is about, is about saying yes to 
all of our brains and all of the world and getting that back into balance. Because when we do that, we realize we're part of this whole system, this whole amazing system, which has so many answers and even more mysteries. And when we get in touch with that, we realize the vastness of its potential. And when we do that, a state of reverence arises within us as a natural way to be in the world. And I would argue that that state of reverence is the very culture of our African heritage. It's right here, right now. So I want to end by saying to you that, yes, I do wear shoes to work, and I want to leave you with a poem. Small wonder the putrid odor that emanates from the shoe. Straight jacket to the foot. Silent strangler that leaves the toes to rot in humid darkness, stolen from the soil. They say that leather moves and breathes its living skin. How pleasant dead animals to cushion and comfort like a padded cell. I yearn only to tear them loose and stand free, my feet alive, spread out, and feeling how the earth sings beneath me. Thank you. <laughs>